Thanks, everyone. So, as an Aboriginal woman myself, Bunjalung by descent, Gadigal by birth, and Wollumbi by law, um, I'm here tonight to bust some myths. What you'll see behind me on the screen in just a second is Budge Bim in Victoria. A lot of people believe that business is new to Indigenous people, but this is actually a picture of a 12,000 year old enterprise. Each year it would employ hundreds of people as they harvested, processed and distributed eels right across Australia. And Meriwether Chert from Newcastle was also traded across Australia, right across to the Kimberley for spear tips. These are businesses by any definition, and they're businesses that would have been considered large, prosperous and viable. And they delivered to a triple bottom line. Firstly, financially, because we used resources and shared them right across Australia, making sure that everybody was included in sharing those resources. They also delivered socially. Everybody had a role and a responsibility and nobody was left out. And they delivered sustainability, which is probably why many of you haven't seen the evidence. But if you'd like to have a look, you visit Budge Bim, and there are 12,000 year old stone houses that sit around these eel traps, which busts another myth that we didn't actually live in settled communities, because we did. <laughs> or you can head out to Western New South Wales and visit the Brewarrina fish traps. Similar to Budge Bim, they're 30,000 years old. Just to put that into context, Stonehenge is only 4,000 years old. So if we've got this 60,000 plus years of history of Indigenous business, sustainable, prosperous business, why am I standing before you tonight asking for your assistance? What we didn't have was a monetary system. And in today's world, we operate in a capital economy. And um, I'm quite happy to let go of the monetary system. Is anyone with me? <laughs> yeah, not as many laughs as I hoped. <laughs> People are still holding on to it, which is why we're here tonight. Because we've got these entrepreneurs that we're working with who have fabulous ideas, but what they don't have is access to capital. So if we can bring those ideas to life by investing in Indigenous businesses, these aren't grants, these are investments. But don't take my word for it. I'd like to introduce Dee Greer Yinderman Kali, who's a Wiradjuri woman with a fabulous idea, and I'll let her tell that story. Hi, my name is Dee Greer Yinderman Kali. I'm an Aboriginal woman from Wiradjuri Nation in Central Western New South Wales, and this is my business, Excess Fit. Excess Fit has been in development for the last four years, and Excess Fit designs and manufactures plus size activewear, sizes 18 to 28, for men and women. It started because 60% of the global population is considered overweight or obese, and there's such a large gap in the market with activewear not filling it. It was a very steep and expensive learning curve with my other business, Yindi Arts, investing $80,000 in capital. And I'm proudly telling you tonight that Excess Fit is now ready for manufacture. We put in five loan applications uh, with your general financial institution. One, one application even had a house of security, but we needed three months trading figures. And unfortunately, we were denied those five applications because we were a start-up business. I did apply through Indigenous-specific funding as well, through Indigenous Business Australia. And the experience that I had with them was unprofessional, undignified, and basically a waste of nine months of my time. Because there were no statistics on the plus size activewear market, we were seen as too high risk. Prime Minister and Cabinet loved the product. They loved the concept, and they actually wanted to buy some of the product. But due to not having a remote address, I was ineligible for their funding. First Australian's capital, on the other hand, had been nothing but supportive and incredibly hard working into finding capital for Excess Fit. They believe in me as an entrepreneur and they believe in Excess Fit as a business. And First Australian's capital actually gave me a small loan to start manufacture. So for Indigenous entrepreneurs like me, without First Australian's capital, there would be no help and certainly no hope. Thanks, Joss. So how can you help entrepreneurs like Dee and the 51 other qualified Indigenous businesses we're working to raise capital for? Firstly, we need your belief in Indigenous business. We're looking for advisors with industry networks willing to share with entrepreneurs bringing new products to the market. We certainly welcome your donations for our capital fund. 
and we need invest investors willing to take risks. I'm sure you've read in the papers that the government currently spends $30 billion a year trying to close the gap in Indigenous disadvantage. And Dee's an example of that, government funding that wasn't able to assist in this case. But what we believe is that Indigenous disadvantage has become an industry in this, com in this country for bureaucrats. And First Australians Capital is aiming to disrupt that industry. We're investing in Indigenous economic independence. By backing Indigenous entrepreneurs, we're creating businesses in communities that employ Aboriginal people in communities and give purpose, sharing culture and sharing knowledge, not just for their own communities, but for all of Australia. So please tonight consider investing with First Australians Capital and help us help other First Australians drive a new economy for all of Australia. <laughs> <laughs>